your dreams are bigger, bolder, and more badass than the life you're living now, but something just keeps getting in the way. Join certified coach and former therapist Diane Wingert for the Driven Woman Podcast. She'll show you how to get rid of whatever is holding you back so you can stop spinning your wheels and up-level your life. Get ready to hop in and buckle up. This is the Driven Woman Podcast, and we're heading for the fast lane. Hey, hey, and welcome back to my fellow driven women. Can I just say it really pisses me off that acknowledging a mental health diagnosis and the fact that you're receiving help is still in 2021 such a source of stigma and shame. I call bullshit on that. And I want to express gratitude to the brave, clever people on YouTube, Instagram, and my favorite TikTok, not to mention those who have started mental health themed podcasts for all they do to normalize mental health conditions by dropping their masks and sharing their struggles. In my opinion, they have done more to raise awareness and spread hope in just the last couple of years than the psychiatric community has been able to do in decades. So in today's solo episode, I will share with you my thoughts about being a person with a difference in my case, ADHD, and what those four little letters mean to me. You know, ADHD is a mouthful when you spell it out, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Not only is the clinical label totally confusing because people with ADHD can and do pay attention. Have you ever heard of hyper focus? And many of us aren't even hyperactive. And the words deficit and disorder are so triggering to so many people, it prevents them from ever even scheduling a diagnostic appointment. So if you suspect or know that you have ADHD and you don't want to pledge allegiance to any of the factions within the community, those who say it's a superpower and others who say it's a disability, but you do, in my opinion, need to decide what you make it mean about you about your life, about your options, about your abilities. So listen in as I share my journey with ADHD, with the diagnosis, what I make it mean, and the choices that I have made that I think just might work for you. This week's pod praise comes from Kadon23, who writes, fun, inspiring, and impactful. Diane's enthusiasm for making all our lives better is so fun to be around great conversations driven by a true desire to make a difference and continue on her own path of self-growth and personal development are super inspiring. So lucky to have come across this pod. Well, thank you, Kate on 23. I feel lucky to have you as one of our listeners. And for those of you who have not yet left your review, come on, don't leave a girl hanging. The links are right there in the show notes. And what's also in the show notes this week is my recommendations for other podcasts that I think may be of interest to you, as well as some of the Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok influencers that I think are making the world a better place for anyone who has a mental health diagnosis. So with no further delay, here are my thoughts on being different, not deficient. I hope you enjoy. Okay, I promise not to get too ranty, but maybe just a little. You know, I have given this topic so much thought, and it's still a little bit of a conundrum. I mean, bottom line, nobody wants to be different, but everybody wants to be special. You see the problem? I mean, we kind of have to get comfortable with standing out, but at the same time, trying desperately to fit in. Why does this even feel necessary? I mean, I don't know about you, but I really admire people who have the courage to just stand out and let their freak flag fly. I love TikTok for this reason. The pure and simple fact that there are so many people on this app who are promoting self-acceptance of whatever their difference happens to be. I know how hard it is to love and approve of yourself when you have had to overcome internalized shame and rejection sensitivity. And that's why these people are my new heroes and role models. Now, to be clear, 
I am not talking about the ones who are desperately trying to look like they're not trying, but they are really, really, really trying to attract attention for being different. I'm not talking about them. I mean, come on, there are tattoos and then there are full face tattoos. Am I right? And I'm a tattoo enthusiast, by the way. Everyone in my family has tattoos from a custom Ganesha, you know, the Hindu elephant god that covers my son's entire back to the full sleeve, half thigh, and many others that decorate my daughter. I even have a couple myself, both acquired in my 50s after decades of impulses that I did not indulge. But the ones I'm inspired by are the people who are maybe a little eccentric and they kind of don't fit in because they would have to really disown themselves to do so. And they genuinely couldn't care less if anyone notices or cares that they're different. Those people are my heroes because they have found a way to rise above the relentless pressure to conform to the norm. And in my opinion, that means regressing towards the mean. These individuals are actually individuals. And that takes so much honesty and courage, especially when you can just be yourself without being angry, without being resentful, and without having a chip on your shoulder. Now, I have certainly known people who are different, who kind of shove it in your face in an aggressive manner. They want to make other people uncomfortable. They want other people to notice that they're different. And what are you going to do about it? Honestly, I hurt for those people because it feels like their rejection has become a badge of honor. And the only way they can cope with it is by flipping it around and shoving it in everybody else's face. In my opinion, that seems like a shitty way to spend your life. You know, we learn that we're different in early childhood in both direct and more insidious ways. Parents try to get their kids to conform because they believe that life will be harder for them when they stand out. And kids are just evil. (laughs) I mean, evil, they're honest. They point out differences. They point out what parents perceive as flaws. And then they taunt other kids with nicknames that reflect those things. I mean, most of the time it's, it's something minor, like calling a kid Bugs Bunny because they have prominent front teeth or calling them four eyes because they need corrective lenses. But hey, if your family has the means, you can fix those things. You can put braces on your kid. I put braces on all three of my kids and get them contact lenses. But what is the message if our differentness is something that we can't fix? We can't buy our way out of. We can't put braces on our brains. What if our difference makes us stand out and get noticed in a way that is going to last for life? I mean, what if your difference is that you're gay or non-binary? What if you have a different operating system? What if you are wired to be ADHD or on the autism spectrum? What if you have Tourette's? Good luck hiding that. What do we do then? And more importantly, what do we as those who have these conditions make them mean when this is the way we are different? Kids who act different from other kids get picked on. They get teased, they get bullied, and they get shamed by both their peers and even sometimes their teachers. Their parents get urged, sometimes required, by those in the school district to get those kids tested and treated so that they can be like everyone else or at least have a chance to act like they are. This begins the process of internal rejection and the stigmatization of being different that can last a lifetime. Parents often become defensive and will yank their kid out of school and try to find a more progressive environment, or they get bully shamed into having their kid labeled and medicated even when they don't agree that there is a problem. Oftentimes the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and the parent has the same issues as their kid. Some of them don't even know. In fact, this is how most women find out they have ADHD, because one of more of their kids get diagnosed. And then they're like, oh, wait. So when your child is singled out and identified as different, that can resurface old wounds and a fresh experience of rejection for many parents. And in a lot of cases, if it's a straight couple, 
and a child that's being singled out and identified, one of the parents immediately wants to rush to treatment and the other one says, no way my kid is being drugged and labeled. This has led to at least one divorce I know of. So listen, let me be clear. This is not a diatribe against mental health treatment or the field of child psychiatry. On the contrary, I have personally witnessed countless lives changed and families saved when a child truly needs medication to function, to learn, to have a social life, to participate in the community in a meaningful way. What I am talking about is the fact that our very human nature dictates that we all kind of need to conform and behave according to some agreed upon standards. And there's not a whole lot of tolerance for those that don't. This has been true across all of human history all around the world. I spent a couple weeks in Mongolia a number of years ago as part of a medical team that went there to teach and provide services to a pediatric hospital. It was a fascinating experience and I realize now was the very beginning of my relationship with Buddhism. Anyway, I lectured on the topic of suicide prevention because there was a growing concern at the time about the rising suicide rates among teens and young adults. What was both fascinating and horrifying to me is that in Mongolia, at least at that time, both children and adults who had either a mental illness of any kind or a developmental disability at any level were left in institutions by their families. Now, most of the Mongolian culture is nomadic. So families follow their herds and they do not have the wherewithal to meet the safety needs of a family member of any age that can't follow directions and behave as they're expected to. So they were forced to leave them in these institutions, knowing that they would be cared for, knowing they would be safe, and they went on their way. So to be unable to stay with the tribe has always meant being abandoned. And this is the deepest fear of all humans. It's the primary reason why we conform on an existential basis. We do whatever it takes to fit in because when you don't fit in, it carries the risk of being left behind, being excluded, being alienated from your group, from your people. And at least in the case of our ancient ancestors, that could mean the risk of perishing. This is our genetic programming. No wonder we try so hard to be like the others. Being an individual carries the risk of isolation and alienation. You have to be pretty darn evolved to resist that kind of fear. Now, to be clear, I knew I was different from a very early age. I knew I was different because I was adopted. I knew I was different because I didn't look like anyone else in my family. And I just thought differently, behaved differently, had a lot more energy. I I had an insatiable appetite for life from a very early age and just needed a lot of stimulation to keep from getting bored and restless. But I eventually became a psychotherapist and got really good at identifying ADHD in adult women. I was very comfortable telling my patients at that time that having a mental health diagnosis was not necessarily a negative. But I avoided getting diagnosed myself for many years. I mean, deep down, I knew I probably had ADHD. I mean, all of my kids did, and I'm the only parent they all had in common. But I somehow didn't get around to having myself evaluated, even though I was struggling. When I'm being most honest with myself, I kind of have to admit that one of the reasons was I didn't really want a stigmatizing label following me around and becoming a permanent part of my medical history. I didn't want to be labeled. I didn't want to risk being criticized or judged. I was afraid that I could lose my health insurance for having a pre-existing condition. All the while, I'm diagnosing and treating people for the very same thing. Now, that may sound like I'm a big old phony, a big old fraud, and at the very least, a big old hypocrite. But the reality was, I thought, I'm doing well enough. I'm doing okay. And I think it's, you know, sometimes I fantasize about writing a book called The Lies My ADHD Brain Tells Me (laughs) and Other Tales Too Terrible to Mention. But nobody, nobody wants to have a deficit or a disorder attached to them. It's more than just the fear of being different and having anyone find out about it. 
It's about what we make it mean, what that difference means. Well, as you know, eventually I changed my mind and I got myself diagnosed and treated. And since then, I have, quote, come out about my ADHD. I talk about it all the time, publicly. The information is out there. Can't deny it anymore. Won't deny it anymore. But I admit that I can still monitor people's reactions, even if it's on a very subtle, subliminal level. I consider myself pretty intuitive, and I can kind of tell when someone's perception of me has been influenced by knowing about my difference. Sometimes I'll feel their rejection or their judgment or maybe their confusion, and I'll get that kind of knee-jerk reaction of, well, fuck you then. Of course, this is in my thought bubble. I don't actually say it. I have learned to inhibit my verbal impulsivity most of the time. But I can notice when getting this information makes a difference. And I need to remember that their opinion of me is none of my business. It doesn't matter. What matters is my opinion of me. So my goal, at least at this point in time, is I can notice, but I'm not allowed to care. I can notice if people are making a judgment, if it changes the way they think about me, might make them less inclined to be my friend, trust me with their money, hire me to, I don't know what. But my goal is it's okay to notice. I do notice. I just don't want to care. I want to be like those eccentric people who stride through life, standing out in total self-acceptance, going about their business, being very visibly different from others, and not concerning themselves with what anyone thinks about it. I'm definitely not there yet, but I'm working on it. And I want you to think about your goal. What kind of relationship do you want to have with your ADHD? Are you okay with the fact that you hate it? Feel embarrassed by it? Wish you didn't have it? Or do you think it makes you interesting? Makes you kind of fascinating? Makes you kind of funny? Makes you more exciting? Or is it just a facet of who you are? No more, no less important than your eye color or your height. Like every other aspect that makes you uniquely you, what you make of your ADHD is truly up to you. Please don't leave it up to others to decide for you. Don't leave it up to your psychiatrist or your therapist. Don't leave it up to your other family members or friends who have the same diagnosis. And for the love of God, do not leave it up to social media because there's a lot of opinions out there. The only one that should matter is yours. It's your responsibility. It's your identity after all. So what you make those four letters mean matters. It matters because your ability to love and accept yourself depend on what you make it mean. Your willingness to tolerate behavior from others matters based on what you make it mean. What you will aspire to in this life, how much education or training you'll get, how far you'll go in life, does depend, at least in part, on what you make those letters mean. So you get to decide. Don't consume too much media that tells you about all the horror stories and all the terrible things that can happen and all the statistical findings of the lifetime prevalence of ADHD and all the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad things it could mean, because none of that has to matter to you. You get to choose. If you happen to follow me on social media, This is one of my most passionate topics, so please DM me. I would love to dialogue with you about it. And remember, in today's show notes, I am linking you to other people that I think convey a positive, healthy, balanced idea of what it means to be a person who is different. And you might even decide to think what makes you different makes you special. It's your choice make the most of it. I'll see you here next week. Hey, it's Diane. Can I be honest with you? At the beginning of each new year, I always told myself, this is the year I'm going to get my habits dialed in. 
this is the year I'm going to be crystal clear about my goals and I'm going to crush them. This is the year I'm going to get my shit together on every level and I'm going to do it all by myself. Been there, done that, got a whole stack of t-shirts. But you know, it wasn't until I started working with my own coach that I realized what a difference it makes to have guidance, support, and accountability from someone who's not only like-minded, but like-brained. Yeah, I'm talking about another driven woman, entrepreneur, who also has ADHD and has got it going on. I have two openings in my signature one-on-one 12-week coaching program, and one of them might have your name on it. There's a link to a free consult with me in the show notes if you think this might be the year that you really get serious and go all in on an ADHD-friendly business and life. While you're thinking about that, Have a listen to what one of my client's success stories has to say about the difference it made to work with me. I adopted this phrase of this is what we do here instead of trying to make it like for the longest time I was trying to make it fit everybody's need where you were attracted. Yes. So that was, I think, the struggle bus. And I don't think I was aware that I was um, just because I love people. And when you have potential I can help you get there. So I think I was allowing too much wiggle. And that's what you helped me through mostly in my memory of like figuring out that it's okay to say, you know, this is what we do here. This is that stance. And that's how Beyond Common, you know, 12 Essentials for Success in Life, it finally was completed. It was just like this pieces and parts of things that we had done that worked to make us successful. But it was like through that figuring out how to connect everything. And definitely your influence helped me so much. Like it was like, you know, you're, you're an angel. You've been listening to the Driven Woman Podcast with Diane Wingert. One more straight talk and strategy each week that will take you from spinning to winning. Don't forget to hit subscribe in your podcast player so you won't miss a single episode. Then head on over to the Driven Woman free and private Facebook group community. See you there.